microphones. One yeah. of them is that one. That yeah, one. I'll, I'll take one. I'll take that one because he's going first. And yeah, yeah, yeah. So gonna how do I, how do I unmute? Yeah, it's it's just doesn't have mute. Hey, story. Hello. Oh. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, sure. I can I can raise the ten minute twice. So the first time I raise ten minutes, you're ten minutes in. Okay. Second time is ten minutes left. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, cool. And uh, for the guys who want to charge their devices, there is charging sockets in the desk, so look closer. Yeah, yeah. They should be there. And we'll starting in one minute. We'll be starting the next presentation. Okay, um, I think we're at time to, to start the next talk, um, and I'm, uh, okay. So one thing, please, if you are leaving talks early, try and talk, close the doors as, easy, as quietly as possible. I'm failing with my speech today, I do apologize. Um, but let's get on with Ralph Bean and Adam Miller. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Is the mic on? Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, so welcome, State of Fedora Infrastructure. Uh, we're going to divide it into two sections. Generally, I'm going to talk about the applications and services side of thing, and then I'm going to hand it off to uh, Adam, who will talk about the release engineering side of things. Uh, let me get through that. Uh, if you were at uh, um, uh, Denise and Adam's keynote this morning, you'll know that the, the release engineering, I think, is probably the, what did I say? And Matt? Matt and Denise? Denise. Oh, Denise and Adam. Denise and Matt's uh, keynote this morning. Uh, you'll know that, that release engineering is a real priority, so I think that's probably the more interesting part of this talk, looking forward, about 
about how we're going to retool a lot of that, uh, that workflow. Um, so uh, broadly, this is what we'll talk about today. Uh, I'll take the stuff on the, the one column. Adam will take the other. So uh, Fedora infrastructure. Um, before getting into applications and services, our environments, just some numbers um, and some projects that were done on the back end that people don't see. In the last year, we finished our migration from Puppet to Ansible, which makes us much more flexible and able to deploy and deliver services faster. Uh, we use that same process as an opportunity to convert the majority of our hosts from RHEL 6 and upgrading them to RHEL 7. Uh, and here you see a breakdown. We have 516 hosts. Uh, 405 of them are RHEL 7. We have a few RHEL 6 hangers on, and some of those will stay for a while. Uh, just because like the Jenkins builder, we need to keep one in, 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 on RHEL 6 there. Uh, and then we have a number of Fedora hosts in, in our, uh, uh, our, our private cloud, our uh, OpenStack instance. Um, another project on the back end over the last year has been SE Linux. We had uh, uh, the number of hosts we had SE Linux enforcing was, was uh, abysmal in the past, and we've made great progress in bringing that up. Uh, and so that requires extra work along the way to get all the policies right for our specific services. Um, so we're making progress there. Uh, and then we migrated our OpenStack instance. The original uh, instance was set up by hand and not kept in configuration management. Uh, and so we've uh, upgraded to uh, Icehouse uh, in finishing that in the last year and then Ansibleized all that so we're able to then upgrade to the next version in a, a smoother way. Uh, so among applications and services, uh, divide them into two groups, the first being the rewrites and enhancements to three existing apps. Uh, this is the one that I'm probably most excited about that was carried out in the last year is the deployment of Bodhi 2. Uh, and I hope that people like it and enjoy it. Um, the user interface is much more fresh and hopefully enjoyable to use, uh, but a lot of the big improvements are actually in the, the, the code quality itself. Uh, the pre-existing version in Bodhi 1 uh, was written on top of TurboGears uh, 1, which is a, an old, way outdated web framework that we didn't get any sort of upstream support for anymore. Uh, and there were no tests or test suites associated with it, so in order to make a change to it, you had to worry that you weren't gonna break the whole Fedora updates release pipeline. Uh, so now we have a, a very large and comprehensive uh, test suite, regression test suite for that, so we can actually distribute some of the responsibility for that service amongst the team. More of us can hack on it, not just the one uh, original author, which is a huge win uh, for us. Uh, Mirror Manager 2 was also rewritten in the last year. The, uh, it was also on Turbo Gears 1, which we needed to get off of, so this has been rewritten in Flask. Uh, and here's a graph of some of the statistics that we can get out of Mirror Manager 2 now that we can be more flexible with it. It's the thing that you know, manages all of our mirrors. Uh, and this, I think this graph is really interesting if you haven't seen it. Uh, the things in green are the number of mirrors that we have that are synced freshly with the data that we've just released. And so you can see these blips where the purple extends down. Uh, that's when we have finished mashing a new set of repositories and pushed it out. And it takes time uh, for the, the, all the mirrors to finally sync and get that data. Uh, and interestingly, you see at the top in red, we have a whole bunch of mirrors that are registered with us, but they have data that is older than anyone would ever want to, to use. And it's not clear if they're just not, you know, scraping any new data at all, even though they're reporting. So um, we have insights into that now that we can be flexible with Mirror Manager 2. Uh, Fedora Packages is uh, another application that uh, a lot of people, I think, like using but are really frustrated with because of the data corruption issues on the back end and, and caches being out of sync. So there's been no changes to the UI of that, um, but the back end was rewritten almost entirely to hopefully have a more consistent data model uh, and be a more reliable service. So it's kind of a meta app across all of our other apps, so it's kind of a single point of entry to go and find out any information you want about any package in Fedora. Uh, and this is a, just a diagram of that backend rewrite uh, that involves using a, a using fed message to push data freshly to the cache, so it should be available before you even request it, instead of requesting it the first time, having to wait for the cache to load, and then it being faster after that. Now it should be fast the first time you go and look for it. Uh, one of the last changes, major changes to pre-existing systems, and this is also something that you would, you would not be able to see at all on the front end, uh, unless you're using fed package to push things. People have seen this warning. Uh, we renamed, we, we added namespacing both to disk git, uh, our gitalite instance, uh, and to package db2, which is paving the way for the future of being able to ship not just RPMs, but Docker images, and having Fedora contributors being able to commit to Docker files in the same way that they commit to spec files now. So that will be rolling out in the coming year, but a lot of, it was more work than we expected, actually, to add namespacing to all that, because the assumption built into all the software is just that RPMs are the, the thing that we do. Uh, so yes? Uh, on that warning part, um, will the end still exist, or will it eventually be removed? It will be eventually be removed, and we will, the prerequisite for us doing that is we need to patch fed package and our package in order to intelligently rewrite your .git config to point to the new correct place. So 
Yeah, users, developers won't have to do anything, but the, the alias will go away. So new services. Um, Pagger, if, if people have used Pagger, I, I hope that you like it. We get a lot of positive feedback about it. So it's a, a, a forge, kind of like GitHub or, Git, or GitLab, but it's written in Python and boasts a number of features that neither of those have. For instance, all of your issues are kept in a separate Git repository, so it, it enhances the kind of portability of the whole thing, whereas in GitHub you run the risk of having, um, you can always get your data out and get uh, your, your code, uh, but your issues are locked into their service, and so if they ever went the way of SourceForge, right, the whole open source ecosystem would be uh, in a tight spot. So uh, Pagger is our, our answer to that. Uh, in the coming year, we hope to use it to replace some of the other things that we have around, like Track and Fedora Hosted. Um, we have a, a vague roadmap for that, but that um, is on the table. Uh, yeah, and it's very cool. It, we I mean, just last week we put out this new UI for it, so if people haven't seen it, it's really, really slick looking now. So. Uh, HyperKitty, also in the last year, that's um, the, the web archiver, the, the web interface to Mailman 3, uh, which Aurelian Bompard has been working really hard at for the last few years, so we rolled that out this year, and uh, uh, also I, I hope people use and enjoy, uh, enjoy that. I'd add just for our team, uh, it's nice because it provides a REST API where the old Mailman Web Archiver had nothing of the sort, which means that we can begin thinking about integrating mailing list activity in our other applications. Uh, so more on that later. Uh, this is a very small service, MD API, stands for Metadata API. Uh, it's a, a microservice that we, we released this year that very simply just provides a JSON API on top of all of the yum repositories that we push and release. So if you ever wanted to know what provides something else and you wanted to do it from, say, JavaScript, before, I don't know what you would do, but now you can just call out to this JSON API to get that data. It's very quick and easy. This is a fundamental part of that Fedora packages rewrite because previously it had to manage all these local YUM repositories on disk and it, they would collide and get corrupted. So now we have a, a nice, stable point of access for all that data. Uh, Koshi, uh, my team didn't directly work on it, but we helped with the deployment and, and figuring out how to put it in place if people like Koshi, it's really, Cool. It's a continuous integration system for RPMs in Koji, which allows us to detect build, um, fail to build from source errors before the mass rebuilds come along. Uh, and I know a lot of people have been using it and really like it. The PHP maintainer, Remy Collet, uh, sings its praises all day long. So. Uh, and Taskatron, also my team didn't work directly on the development, but we've been helping with the deployment and coordinating it. So Taskatron is, is really cool if you haven't seen it. It has a limited number of checks right now that it runs. It runs automated uh, uh, actions in response to events in our infrastructure. Right now, just doing RPM lint, depth check, and upgrade path. But in the future, uh, we hope to add a whole variety of tasks uh, um, uh, to that to make it more generally useful for uh, blocking and gating things in our, our release pipeline. So upcoming projects. Uh, we have, uh, in the coming year, a need to revamp our entire monitoring infrastructure. Uh, we use Nagios and CollectD for that, but the way that we maintain it is extremely manual and time intensive. So when we want to roll out a new service, there's a checklist of things that we need to do, and those can take, you know, in the worst cases, a week or two, even if the code is already written for the project. So we want to try and get that overhead down to a very small number so we can be more agile and produce uh, and change services faster than, than before. A consequence of that process of rolling out a new service so hard, excuse me, a consequence of, of it being so hard to roll out a new service is that it is then tempting for our developers to instead split our services intelligently amongst like a suite of services to instead bolt functionality onto old existing apps. So you, if you think about Bodhi, for instance, one of the reasons it took so long for that rewrite to happen was it was such a, a, a large, complicated app that involved so many different pieces of functionality. And I think one of the drivers of that process was that our infrastructure was not as agile then as it could have been. We couldn't peel off those components. So, well, build, managing build root overrides right, should be its own service. It doesn't really have anything to do in, with managing updates. So. Uh, monitoring initiative, uh, uh, right next to that, DevOps tooling is something that we'll continue to be working on. We have a pretty good set of those things around, but uh, I think there's a lot more we can do to be able to do stuff faster. Um, statistics and analysis, uh, thank you. Statistics and analysis, we have uh, um, a lot of good data sources that we comb through manually and write scripts in a one-off fashion, like uh, from Matt's uh, uh, keynote today, but um, we are in the process of, we've, we've built the, the, the prototype of a service that can produce those kind of statistics on demand, uh, and it's just a matter of then hammering that into place and, and ensuring that it can do all the things we want it to do, uh, to use it. Uh, Fed message, our message bus will be slightly expanded this year and getting two really nice new data sources that we've been working at for a long time, uh, Bugzilla and Zanata. Sorry? Yeah, 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 yeah. We've been working a long time on the Bugzilla one, so. Um, uh, Taskatron expansion as well, I mentioned, uh, talking about those, those checks that it does right now. 
uh, RPM lint depth check and upgrade path. We'd like to create a disk git style model for Taskatron checks so that people, packagers, can write custom checks for their own packages or, or families of packages and then submit those because the QA team can't, can't possibly you know, predict everything that would need to be tested about everything in the, the huge variety of things in Fedora. Uh, so opening up that to the, the, the packager group um, will, be, will be a good project. Um, front end unification, if you've looked at all of our apps, you'll notice that simply because they were written at different times in the course of the 10 year you know, evolution of, of Fedora infrastructure, uh, they have a, a patchwork feel sometimes where they look very different from one another. So uh, especially over the summer, we're gonna work just on a front end initiative to try and give those a consistent theme. Uh, it is unlikely we will be able to hit every service, but we'll hit enough of them, I think, that um, we can improve that experience uh, for new contributors in particular. Uh, Fast 3. It's another topic. We have FAST2, the Fedora account system, and it is beginning to show its age. Uh, so FAST3 has almost completed being rewritten, but it's a ma matter of uh, you know, finalizing the API transition uh, problems that we'll have and then deploying it and getting it out the door. And lastly, Fedora Hubs, uh, uh, also mentioned this morning, is a uh, new project that we've been designing over the last year, and uh, development on that will really, I think, begin in earnest in, in the spring of this year, in the, in the coming months. Uh, here we have a mock-up from uh, uh, Mo Duffy, uh, it's it's going to be really cool. Uh, think um, uh, a portal like a like an intranet for Fedora uh, project developers. And intranet's a dirty word. I know, I know. <laughs> Garrett doesn't like that word at all. But uh, uh, it, it primarily is trying to serve two um, bodies of people: new contributors, in particular non-technical contributors that don't have any sort of experience with using IRC or using mailing lists, uh, and that who like look at Fedora as this huge pile of like sub teams and communities, but have no idea where to fit themselves uh, into that. With Fedora Hubs, uh, the, the gist is that they'll be able to go to this web portal and then be dropped immediately into IRC with a ZNC bouncer on the back end so they have the history, they can connect with people, they can see what people are doing with a fed message stream uh, that shows the activity of various teams and subteams. So I'm um, very excited about that. So, uh, and that's all I have from the application services side. So. Um, <coughs> I'm going to talk about release engineering infrastructure. Uh, by show of hands, who went to Dennis Gilmore's talk earlier about release engineering? Oh, not as much as I'd hope. I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail about like what we've been up to and where we're going um, in 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 mass with all the work that's going on. I'm going to touch on a little bit of it, but I'm mostly going to t think of, uh, talk about um, what the motivations for what we're doing, um, some of the infrastructure pieces that are in place and that are being worked on to enable uh, future work. Um, <clears throat> but before I do that, I kind of want to talk about. Um, oh, that got chopped off. That's cool. Okay, I kind of want to talk about um, <clears throat> just. Fedora, where, where we are, where we come from, where we're going, uh, thinking about Fedora as an operating system and, and thinking about kind of some of the ideas that keep getting talked about, the modular, modularization, the rings and things like that. And it, when you think about operating systems, uh, there's kind of this, this weird split. And, and uh, this question on the first line, I'm, I'm pretty sure I, I stole from Alex Larson. Um, but where does the operating system uh, end and the application begin? And, and we kind of need to answer that question when we move into this world of modularization um, and we, we decide what ends up in kind of an application tier versus in the base operating system. Um, <clears throat> and it, kind of imagine a world where those things aren't tight, tightly coupled. Uh, and, and examples of those are, are Docker, Rocket, XDG app, and whatever might come next, like whatever the new hotness ends up being. Um, and I think examples, of like really good examples of working uh, functions of that are, are Android and iOS and, uh, well, Firefox OS is dead now as of yesterday, I think, so uh, bad example. Chrome OS. But the idea is, is these, these particular operating systems and their implementation, you have an application space and it, it runs and you install your applications in separate lifecycle management from your base operating system. Your base operating system can be updated independently and there might need to be cache regenerations and optimizations for the runtimes and those kinds of things as updates get applied for the layers on top. But you, you have these things that are loosely coupled and they can transition between different versions. I mean, for example, you can take um, an Android application, you can write it and, uh, and submit it to the build system and then people running Android 4.4, 5.1, and 6.0 can all install that application and they can update in between from 4.4 to 5.1, 5.1 to 6.0. And basically what happens is, is there's a, a you know a cache regen or a, a, a re-optimization of um, you know, and if you can even change backend runtimes, you know, they, they switched from um, uh, Dalvik to Art and, and you know those kinds of things. So like we can this can be done, it has been done, and just kind of thinking about that in the context of Fedora. So that that kind of comes to the Fedora rings, and I know the rings uh, idea has been has been talked about a lot with the the next, but I, I wanted to what? 
Oh. Well, yeah. Anyways, um, <clears throat> so and, and this is this is loosely an idea of where where that's going to go. And, and this diagram has been floating around for a very long time. I stole it from uh, Matthew Miller. Uh, um, uh, borrowed, re, I don't know, repurposed, whatever. Fair use. Okay, <clears throat> so Fedora modularization. Uh, so we want to address the use case. And um, I don't, why did that get? I swear this worked at some. It was like it had a better. I don't know, it wasn't falling off the bottom of the page. It's bugging me. My OCD is kind of triggered right now. But anyways, um, so it, the idea is, is that if, if we can decouple these things, we can allow uh, different groups within Fedora to um, cater to their own desires and their own needs. So if folks in the server work group could potentially do something different or on a different life cycle or a different um, uh, cadence than those in the Fedora workstation. And... Um, uh, for, for people who want to run third-party applications, who don't want to consume content through the Fedora official repositories but want to do it uh, in an external context, we can try to provide them a mechanism that allows that to happen in a more, I guess, sane and contained and controlled environment. Um, <coughs> and then also cater to the development of those kinds of things. And well, like so, Ralph mentioned before this this concept of namespace diskit that allows for RPMs and Docker containers. Well, that we also want to leverage that same uh, concept for the future because we don't know what's going to come next. So, if we have this concept where RPMs, because we we existed in a world where um, we existed in a world where RPMs were the only artifact that we distributed. It was the only thing that we actually produced as uh, an end end result. Um, and we would we would couple them, uh, or we would effectively roll them together in different image formats that would be distributed. Um, but in the future, that's not going to be the case. We, we're going to have new delivery mechanisms for sets of RPMs. Those sets of RPMs will be packed into containers, uh, whether that be OS tree based or Docker based or XCG app. Um, but it's going to become different. So <clears throat> the release engineering needs to cater to that, and we need to find a way to react uh, more rapidly and, uh, and handle the ability to enable this but still keep sanity because at the end of the day, we have to ship something that is testable and that is reproducible and that can uh, be verified and, and um, we're not going to just like send you out into the Wild West and uh, every, every time you do an update, everything crashes. Um, I'm not going to say that that will never happen. Uh, our, our QA team is amazing, but they're chasing a, a bullet train constantly uh, and, and there's only so much that can be done. But we try. So tooling today. Um, <clears throat> we have uh, Koji, and Koji is RPM centric, and Koji uh, is is amazing at what it does. And it was uh, created in a time in which RPMs were the only artifact. Um, and this this was before the cloud. This was before um, you know live CDs. Like Koji predates a lot of those technologies, and it, it has actually done a very good job of adapting to that. And uh, Image Factory, show of hands, who went to Ian McLeod's Image Factory talk? All right, awesome. It was a great talk. Uh, it's a great tool. It's it's very good. So, um, <coughs> image factory integration, live CD creator, Pungy. Um, th that's so Pungy is kind of like this weird kind of lie thing, uh, because Pungy three and Pungy four share a name, but they share no code. Uh, so today we're using Pungy, and tomorrow we're going to use Pungy, but they're not the same code base that got rewritten. Uh, Lorax, Bodhi, um, Bodhi 1 versus Bodhi 2, and uh, what I like to call the Wild West, which is Coper. Uh, and Coper is very, uh, very powerful, and it does a lot of really great things. And I, I think, uh, at least for me, I, I use it as kind of like a, a test dev space for things that I'm trying to get officially into, the, into Fedora um, while I'm just trying to hash out my, uh, my spec file. But... <coughs> the, we want to kind of enhance on that. So tooling tomorrow, uh, and kind of today, some things that are, are in process, some things have been done, some things are in flight. Koji 2.0, um, which is still being designed, but some, one of the, the concepts around it is, is content generator centric. Um, and what I think is amazing about that, and for those who have who've followed uh, recently with uh, content generators that got added into the Koji 1.x line, is it's this ability to have this metadata format defined 
uh, enabled build type uh, such that we can have different backends and it, it makes the system more pluggable, makes it more flexible. Uh, live media creator as opposed to live CD creator. Um, Dennis went into very a lot of detail about this, but there was just a lot of legacy cruft with the old tooling that produced our live CDs and we were moving up. Um, secondary architectures in the mainline Koji, uh, that's kind of an arch uh, more of a, an infrastructure side aspect of uh, release engineering instead of having these secondary Kojis that have to live and exist in weird places. It would, it would kind of fall under the umbrella of primary Koji. It's just that if the builds for secondary architectures were to fail, it wouldn't fail the build um, for the primary architectures. It would just send notification as it normally does. So uh, Pungy 4, and this is kind of where I was talking about. So Pungy 4 uh, is going to enable us to, um, uh, for those who may have uh, followed along, um, Adam Williamson wrote up a, a really, really great uh, kind of summary of, of what this is and what it means for us. Uh, in the past, composes of Rawhide did not match composes that became test candidates. Well, you, but you wrote to the mailing list. Yeah. It's a, all right. Oh, I'm sorry. So uh, Adam Williamson said that he's he's actually writing a, a a post like a blog post about this in detail, um, and it's currently in draft format. But to look for it on Planet Fedora or um, his uh, website, Happy Assassin. Um, so. Uh, that, that is going to change it, and that's actually going to enable a lot of things, and it, it makes our, our daily compose process and, and our nightly compose and our development process match more of what ends up becoming the, the finalized Fedora product, the thing that gets shipped out to everybody that allows us to um, have these things look more one-to-one. Uh, Fedora Atomic two-week releases. This is uh, in f this is in production now. We are doing two-week releases. We've had uh, six of them, five, five, six of them. Um, we we want to continue to iterate on this. There's a lot of aspects of this process that we kind of just had to shoehorn in, and we want to clean up and and remove a lot of technical debt and enable this, um, and then. Um, uh, trying to again enable and find new ways to integrate with uh, the Wild West, and like right now we already have the ability to just DNF enable, uh, DNF Copra enable things, and that's great. And we want to kind of try to figure out where that's going to fit into the release engineering pipeline in the future, and and if we can have a way to allow Copers to be that loosely coupled build environment, but still be have gated tests and those kinds of things on them. That, a lot of that's floating in the air. So two week atomic releases, and in uh, some of these slides and some of these diagrams. Um, I actually talked about at um, Flock, and the reason I'm still talking about them is some of them are still being worked on. Um, other ones had to be rewritten, and I'll kind of discuss that. Uh, this one, I uh, will again have to give credit to Matt Miller for putting this together. Um, but it's, it's our two-week release cycle, and a lot of this is in place now. Um, a lot of it exists, but we need to get better at it. So the build um, is done but we want to get better at it. We want to allow for builds to happen more rapidly. Right now they happen nightly. We want them to uh, be more reactive. And uh, Ralph uh, mentioned earlier uh, Product Definition Center. You did not mention it? Okay. Dennis talked about it in the talk the hour before this. So Product Definition Center um, is a system that will be a place where we store information about composes, and it will allow us to query them and be reactive based on uh, things that uh, happen with them. And I think I have a slide about it in the future in a couple. And if I don't, I have failed you all. Um, <clears throat> But we want to get to a point where the builds happen based on actual changes. So we will know what goes into an atomic com um, image. And when a compose happens, we can. Um, uh, trigger tests and things on that, or rebuild components of the system that need to, that are necessary based on changes uh, in the environment. So basically, we can take the manifest of, of what goes into an atomic image. We can query Product Definition Center. We can then say, okay, well, we saw a Fed message come across saying that a new component hit Koji. It got built. So now we need to rebuild these images and rebuild these OS trees so that we have those updates. Um, test right now, uh, that is AutoCloud, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, the test component uh, was bootstrapped basically from zero. It was kind of invented off to the side in the sake of time. We, it, was, it was one of those things where we wanted to get this thing out and have it, have it rolling forward. Uh, a decent amount of that back end is going to be reworked. We're going to uh, work with the Fedora QA team to standardize on Taskatron and get this in uh, so that it, it's part of the, the full uh, project product pipeline, and we're we are complying with you know the the test case, and that we're not reinventing wheels as we continue forward. Um, the release piece of this, 
uh, right now is a, a Python script, and uh, you can go look at it. It's really bad. Uh, don't don't think ill of me when you look at it. If you do, um, uh, one thing that we're doing in this space that's uh, an effort that's already started is we're creating a library. It's called Fedora Lib Releng, FLR, and, uh, and, and that is set up to allow <coughs> all the different components that are kind of reusable, all the processes and things in Fedora release engineering, to put them into a library such that all of the scripts in the release engineering repository will, should eventually just be sl slim wrappers around this set of functions, and we're passing inputs into them to get the outputs that we want. And just to kind of take that one further, <coughs> as we need to in the future, the back end of those API points should be able to be disparate systems or fire off some Ansible task out into uh, the infrastructure and, and allow it to be more distributed and more parallel. Um, so as we go on, we're continuing to iterate to make that release piece uh, better. But um, right now, when the Atomic two-week two release goes out, we upload the images to the mirror. The website is updated, which I have uh, something on uh, in a little bit, and uh, it's automatically uploaded to uh, Amazon EC2 via uh, Fed image, and uh, and that's part of the present. So we have the the links to the web, and then uh, the email announcement. The email announcement we also want to improve on. We need to do some introspection pieces into the OS trees so we can actually do diffs between them and provide a useful change log. Uh, and those kinds of things. So we're, we're continuing uh, to iterate on this, but a lot of this is in place. Uh, bug U, uh, which I'm pretty sure I'm going to talk about in a second, bug, the bug filer, uh, we have an automated uh, bug filer in the works right now that will actually, uh, as the tests run and find problems, it will automatically file bugs in Bugzilla. So here's AutoCloud. This is what AutoCloud looks like uh, at the face value. It just kind of gives us a nice uh, web view of uh, tasks that have run. Uh, they have passed or failed. Um, Kushal Das and uh, Cyan um, did a lot of really great work to enable this, and they did it in record time. Like I don't think they slept for about a month. Uh, we had this in, in no time. And it, this tests, this automatically tests QCOW2 cloud images, the um, Vagrant, both Libvirt and VBox, uh, and then um, Adam Williamson enabled the it's auto or open open QA, open QA uh, ISO installer. So we actually also test the ISO installer of the Atomic Two Week image uh, before it goes out. Uh, this is the the view of the website. It's been updated. Ralph uh, did the work on this, and uh, and we now are able to present the updated images as soon as they land. And there's a, a nice little kind of note in the middle there that is is generated for you that tells you how old the images are. Um, at the time that I took the snapshot, the images were only five days old. So we are doing. <coughs> we took something that was a six week rele release cycle, and we shoved it down to two weeks. And we were we we're trying to get to a point where we can actually iterate it on it faster to where the subset of Fedora packages that go into Atomic can be effectively whitelisted in the Bodhi update system. And what that would mean is these set of packages have automated tests in Taskatron such that we trust them to where if these automated tests pass, when they pass, that particular package will be marked stable in Bodhi. Uh, we're not there yet. I'm not going to lie to you and say that we have this in, in, in place today. Thank you. Um, but it's getting there. <clears throat> so Product Definition Center, uh, spoke about this before, repository and API for storing, querying product metadata. So effectively, a product is the different additions uh, in Fedora nomenclature. Uh, single source of truth. So right now, if you want to kind of get this kind of information, you have to scrape logs and do kinds of all kinds of weird queries. Yeah, Adam Williamson knows this intimately, and it is probably one of his, yeah, it's, um, Ralph did the work on this. It's amazing. Uh, I pdc.fedoraproject.org. It's up. It's live today. You can go in and look at and, and query information about it. Uh, here's a quick diagram of kind of what goes into it. So we have the scripts and the humans, and we can do queries. Um, PDC updater uh, audit script, which is great. So one of the things and one of the concerns in the past was that if something goes wrong or if a Fed message gets dropped off the edge of the planet, what you know, how will we? catch that. And so PDC Updater will do the run and actually uh, provide us eventual consistency. And eventual basically means every day. So every day it will be ensured to be consistent. Um, and even in the event that it, something happens, it can start over and retry and pick up uh, and those kinds of things. So 
Docker layered images, <clears throat> this is a big thing. I talked about this at Flock. The reason I'm still talking about it is because in November, um, Docker Registry v2 happened, so the back end of the system had to be rewritten because it was v1, and uh, Docker as of 1.10 or 1.11 is going to completely drop support for v2 uh, or v1 registries. So uh, we just said if we're going to do this net new uh, in Fedora space, why even pay attention to the old stuff? So this had to be rewritten, but it is uh, powered on top of OpenShift. It is a uh, build system. We're using uh, their source to image. Uh, build pipeline, their image streams, those kinds of things. Um, in the future, this will do automatic rebuilds of uh, images. So if you are to be a, a maintainer, let's say, for example, Cockpit uh, is doing a Docker uh, layered image inside of this Fedora space, and there's a CVE for the base image, um, the system will automatically rebuild that layered image for, uh, for us in the product space. So that way, um, users out in, in uh, Fedora space are able to constantly get new software updates without packagers have to go in and, and doing layered rebuilds. And for anybody who's maintained Docker images will probably be familiar with that amount of pain. So uh, OSBS and container build upstreams uh, are fantastic. If anybody is interested in participating in any of those, also in part of the OSBS ecosystem is a tool called Atomic uh, Reactor, which is a uh, Docker build environment um, that allows you to do introspection into um, container builds. It's, it's very, very cool. Um, we're also going to be working on pulp integration to do SDN scale out of our, uh, of our registry. Fedora will have a registry. Um, for two reasons. One, to be our official distribution point of these artifacts, and two, um, to allow base image uploads rapidly. Um, for Docker official base images, you actually have to load the tarball into Git and do a pull request against them, and a human has to go in and sign off, and it's a whole thing, um, and they don't let us do it more than once a week. So for Rawhide, we want every time a Rawhide build happens to land. Um, quick overview of the service. Um, the endpoint would be the Fedora layered image maintainers. They would have their Docker file and their app init scripts and docs and whatever in disk it. That's going to do a fed package container build, which will fire up in Koji. Koji will send out um, to the, um, oh, I, my line went the wrong way on that one. Sorry. It will actually go out to the OpenShift V3, an atomic reactor in OSBS, uh, which will then upload directly into the registry, which is where the users and contributors will uh, consume from. In the future, the magical future, we want to have PDC integration. We want to have Taskatron tasks tied to this so that we can gate and make sure that uh, these images are functional and pass before we actually ship them. Um, fed message handlers uh, so that we can be more reactive and uh, other things. So oh. uh, what's next? Containers. We're going to support alternate container, container formats uh, uh, as was mentioned in the image factory talk. Um, the core, somebody from CoreOS is, is going to contribute uh, the ability to do rocket containers in, uh, in Koji, um, run C, freight agent, um, the workstation based on Project Atomic Tech, uh, something OS tree based, which was also talked about in Dennis Gilmore's talk a little bit more at length. Um, Nulicule apps, we want to kind of find a way to cater to allowing um, multi-container applications to be built at the, the same time in the build system so you don't have to submit each piece one by one. Um, <clears throat> and new hotness. I put in new hotness just as a vague thing. Um, the automated build pipeline is something that we're working on. I also have a dream of being able to have more release engineering tasks be self-service. There's a lot of things that people come in and request of release engineering in the track instances, and I want to have that be self-service. And my idea for that right now is Ansible Tower. Um, and you have this kind of web portal front end to where if you're in the proper fast group, you have um, things presented to you such that you can um, just kind of click and, and run those tasks on your behalf, and it would provide us with good logging and uh, the ability to hey, do fed message handling, those kinds of things. Um, on the back end of that, being Ansible-based, we're actually working with uh, internal Red Hat PNT DevOps uh, RCM uh, to kind of try and find places where uh, automated tooling can be shared so that we're not reinventing these kinds of things and that we also have more uh, people involved in, in the development of the, the entire processes and those, those sorts of things, which I don't know. Uh, I haven't been in release engineering in Fedora for that long. I've been here for about nine, ten months. Uh, I don't know if that's ever been done before, but it has uh, so far been a very fruitful relationship, um, and uh, I'm looking forward to it moving forward. Uh, for the most part, that's kind of what release engineering is up to on the infrastructure standpoint and kind of plans where we're going to try to make all this better, uh, more approachable, and, uh, and more adaptable for new, uh, <coughs> new technologies in the future. Um, any questions?
Yes. We do not, no. uh, uh, but we, we have our own uh, bootstrap theme that we're going to be standardizing on called Bootstrap Fedora based on Bootstrap 4, I think, is the latest one that came out. So it's very similar to Patternfly, but it's not the same tech. Uh, our designers, uh, Ryan Lurch, uh, uh, just thought that Patternfly, I don't know, didn't match the Fedora theme, so. Yes? Yeah, yeah. <coughs> yeah, so, so we tend to self-assign to, oh well, yeah, the question is, how is the, the apps and services team organized? Uh, so if you file a bug on a particular system in our infrastructure uh, and you don't get a response, how should you kind of pursue to escalate it? Yeah, yeah. So uh, we have a very loose or an informal organization of assignment, and it's largely kind of voluntary, where people take up different systems that they find themselves primarily responsible for, but all of us, at least nominally, can fix any bug in any system. Oh, right, that's right, that's right. the goal, right? So you could ask anybody to, to look into it. Um, and I would say that it, it changes also, like sometimes, like when Bodhi 1 was released, a number of us worked exclusively on Bodhi for a month there, but then afterwards then some of us moved to other directions, and Prince Luke right now is working mainly on Bodhi. So Come and ask in Fedora apps yeah, would be there. So pound Fedora dash apps on Freenode. Yeah. Yes. So the question was, um, what kind of monitoring do we have in place if something were to die, like a hard disk, um, what's kind of, how long does it take for something to react? Ralph would probably have better perspective on, on the daily ops of that. Yeah, and, and I never have to deal directly with anything related to disks and hardware, but we have other members of the team who do that. We use Nagios for, for monitoring, uh, so that is the short answer to that. And we have a centralized logging infrastructure uh, that where people can detect some things prematurely that way uh, and actively watch those logs. Uh, for what it's worth, also collect D to monitor system performance. Uh, and that's all public. You can, everyone can go and look at it. Question. So the, the question was, uh, is Fedora working on reproducible builds? And if so, are working with the Debian folks working on reproducible builds? Um, I, I think that's a, a vocabulary overload. Um, what we mean by reproducibility is, is more so that uh, if you have a compose of things or if you have a, a set of inputs, you would get the same set of outputs in terms of um, build artifacts to images and those kinds of things, making sure that the process can create reproducible components. Um, like binary ABI reproducibility, those kinds of things, that is not something that we're currently tracking or, or chasing. Um, but we, uh, well, I shouldn't say we're not tracking it. We're, there are a number of people in the Fedora world that are paying attention to what Debian's up to, but we don't currently have plans to implement that in, in Koji or anything, uh, to the best of my knowledge. Mike, do you have a... a Okay, all right, so uh, Mike M, everybody, uh, half of the Koji development team uh, right there. Uh, I, I mainly asked him because uh, if, if there was something uh, happening in the build system that was gonna support that, I assumed he would know, so thank you. Okay, we're out of time. Uh, of people who ask questions, if you don't currently have a scarf and would like one, come please come get one. Uh, we have three of them to give out to question askers, and I know a few of you already have one because you've previously asked questions, but um, thank you for your time.
everybody's being on. No, that's fine. I'm just going to make it back. Have a good day.